You ever thought that wine would pair well with music? Welcome to House Uncorked, a full, rich, flavored series of podcasts that are all about sharing a story, opinions on wine choices, and pairing that vibe with a live house music set. It's fun, real, raw, and positive conversations between wine pairing and house music. Now, join DJ Day right now for this week's episode of House Uncorked. Welcome everybody to uh, to <laughs> season two, episode six of House Uncorked. It's a podcast uh, of real talk uh, with wine pairing to live music. So tonight, I have my special guest tonight, and it's all about art. Um, it's um, how well do you know art? And a lot of people uh, online were saying it'd be a great topic to talk about. So. I have a friend of mine and um, an art professional and auctioneer. I can say that correct. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Perry Tung, thank you very much for joining me on my podcast tonight. Cheers. Okay. I'm intrigued on the fact that um, your side of the business, on just um, you know going through the beautiful art that you find on from years like from I don't know like centuries old in, in some cases. So I'm going to let you talk about it. I uh, appreciate you coming as my guest tonight and. So you're an art auctioneer. Um, now you know art very well, obviously. Um, and can you tell me or tell us, you know, what what company do you work for? So now I work for Bonhams. I've been there for the last ten years. Okay. Uh, before that, I was with a smaller uh, Toronto auctioneer um, for another ten years. So I've been in the art business now for you know twenty two years. Um, okay. I started a small public gallery, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, I just found the auction house and worked my way up and um, get to see some amazing things every day. It's well, I can never imagine the, the, the art, like, you know, just from some, and I don't know any of the artists by name, but it's like, you know, you're representing or you're selling this piece of work, this artwork that is for thousands, even millions. I don't know, maybe millions, yeah, but. Millions. Um, yeah. And it's like, so. In, in your particular case, you got an art that um, somebody needs to sell, or it's from an uh, or just to auction off. And it's from a famous uh, artist. It, what's like? How do you determine that value of that art? So I think it all starts with the first inquiry. Usually, they'll send us an image, or they'll they'll contact us, whether okay. it's through email, telephone. We'll go out. We want to see the painting, the sculpture in person. We want to look at the condition. Mm-hmm. And what we're also looking for is information that's going to tell less the story of the painting. Where did it come from? So what's its provenance? Provenance is the story behind the painting. So we're looking for gallery labels. Okay. We're looking for um, collectors put stamps on the backs of certain drawings. We're looking for any information, if it's been exhibited, we're looking for any information like that, that we can actually go and um, it's detective work. Then we trace back to where the painting was. Um, and that's the fun part of the job because we're like piecing together its past all the way, usually, hopefully all the way back to coming out of the artist's studio. So that's the very, that's important. That's an important part of the, the valuation process. Right. Then what we do is we work with, um, or we have access to auctions that have taken place worldwide. Mm-hmm. So we're looking at comparables for the size, the year it was painted, painted by that artist. How rare is that <laughs> painting? Um, what did the artist do in his life? We're looking at all these different variables when right. we come up to the price. Hmm, interesting. And when we do put an estimate on a painting, it's our best guess. We don't know. Right. We are specialists in a certain area. Sure. We never class ourselves as experts. We are specialists. We specialize in one area. And we put something up for sale. It could go for a lot more. We're, this is our best guess. Gotcha. Okay, so, there, so that's what I also wanted to get to is the fact that if that same painting or that same artist had another artwork that was selling, you don't know. You don't... It's only based on what your evaluation is. Yeah. So we're, you know, we're putting it out into the marketplace, and when it comes down to it, it's going to be the public that decides on what it's going to sell for. Um, and then variables come in with the buyers as well. It comes into the fact that, okay, is it an estate situation, and we have two um, siblings fighting over it that they want to buy it? Right. Is it something more along the lines of that? Um, there's tons of collectors for this artist, right. and they're all going after it. Right. It, it's 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 very psychological when it when we put something into the marketplace, 
Um, it's always very interesting to see sort of leading up to the sale. Okay, how many phone bids do we have on something? Do we have any absentee bids left on something? Um, what kind of interest being generated for that specific piece? Sometimes it's not the piece we're thinking is going to sell for a lot of money. It's something else in the sale that we don't know and it just takes right. off. Interesting. I mean, so uh, is there a specific place that you have you do have the, all these auctions or? So uh, Bonhams is I Bonhams is the third largest auction house in the world. Um, we're like Christie's and Sotheby's, okay. and so we our main sale rooms are New York, uh, London, England, LA, and Hong Kong. Excellent. And how do one person, or how does this person get to know that you are selling this art? Like, is there do you have to register or be part of a club or be part of something that that tells you, hey man, we're going to get this this uh, this art from so and so? So the most valuable thing that an auction house has is its mailing list. So each of the departments and bottoms has mailing lists for specific collectors. Mm -hmm. And when a catalog is produced, they're on that list. So they, we make sure they get the catalog. We make sure they get the condition reports. We make sure that they know it's coming up for sale. And we do this, uh, it's a lot of lead time leading up for, ahead of the sale. We have preview times. Um, aside from that, on a more personal level, I have a, a, a listing of clients that I will contact and let them know. Excellent. Okay. That something is coming up for auction. Okay. And I know I know their collections. I'm very familiar with their collections. I've worked with them for a number of years. Okay. And you know, it's like placing a nice piece with them. So I let them know, and then it's up to them if they want to bid on gotcha. it. Gotcha. So you know, you have to actually do your, uh, you, you personally do your part by saying, you know what, this person I think would go, would love this art. So yep. you would, you'd contact that person. Um, let them know what's going on. Yep. Uh, not just send out a mailing list hoping that you're going to get a certain percentage to come into your to your auction, right. but you you actually work it. You're... It's a more personal Absolutely. touch. Absolutely. Um, we actually have something coming up in a sale in April, mm -hmm. and it's being sold in London. It's by a Canadian artist. And um, yeah, I've contacted 10 people in Canada that I know would want this thing. So, or this painting. Right. So it's a pretty important painting. Mm -hmm. um, it was painted in 1917, and it ended up in Scotland, and now it's wow. it's uh, being offered in London. So hopefully, are you are you can you subject to the price of these? Uh, paintings? So the painting, this one is valued at eight to twelve thousand pounds. Okay. So yeah, we sell in pounds in London, right. obviously. Um, I've seen Bonhams actually holds the record for a work by this artist, and it, it's a number of years back when we used to hold sales in Canada. Okay. And it was an interior scene, and it's an artist named Peleg Franklin Brownell. Mm -hmm. And it was an interior scene of two girls reading, and it sold for $68,000 wow. against an estimate of 20 to 30, I think. I may be misquoting that, but mm -hmm. the selling price was 68000 Wow. And, you know, because of all this, we're going to get into the, the COVID 19 virus thing, and you can see my. Uh, the toilet papers I have here on my wall of art of toilet paper, it's not for sale, so don't even ask for it. Um, but on, on a more serious note, has this virus or this pandemic affected your attendance or your shows? Yes. Um, auctions, so we usually hold a major, our major um, Chinese and Japanese sales mm -hmm. during Asia Week in New York, which is happening, well, it's happening in March. Well, it's still happening, but we've decided to postpone our sales until June. Okay. We're not canceling any sales. The rest, it's business as usual. We also have the power of the internet, where we can right. actually hold online sales, That's which we ask. do. Mm -hmm. um, our main business is still live auctions, sure. and we're still holding live sales. And the the good part about this is people don't need to be in the sale room to bid. They can bid on the telephone. They can leave a bid or they can bid online. So they don't physically need to be in the room to win something. And we, mm -hmm. we find the majority of our big buyers who want to remain anonymous prefer to go this route. Right. Can these bidders or buyers go through a broker? Is there special brokers that will do this for them? So, yeah, there are consultants who will act on their behalf. There's dealers who are hired by certain buyers who want to remain right. anonymous and will buy on their behalf. Okay. Um, things are changing a little bit more now. There's a lot more compliance rules that are being um, sort of enforced mm -hmm. internationally. We, we want to know who's ending up with the piece. Like, we want to know who who the where it's going. A lot of the time, dealers will want to remain have their clients remain anonymous, and we sure. respect that. <clears throat> we just want to be sure that everything is going is right you know so it eliminates the fact eliminates some speculations of let's say someone knows that this art 
would go for, let's say it goes for 100000 mm-hmm. And they know that if they can bid max, they can get it for 100000 but they know that painting will, can go for two hundred. Mm-hmm. Okay, and they buy that to resell it. Do you have a policy yep. for that? Nope. It's up to the dealer. The dealers can do that. Um, you have to sort of look. I think auction value is always sort of the beginning of the food chain. Mm-hmm. I would like to describe it as. So it's like the start. The dealer comes and buys it, and then they mark it up. So gotcha. we're sort of like... Th- so auction is like the base price. So okay. when you, if you go into a gallery, you're going to be paying probably double what it is at auction. That's how the dealers are making their money, and we totally oh, okay. understand that. Gotcha. Um, given it does doesn't it's not as black and white as that mm-hmm. it can change where obviously auction can take over from the dealer or right. the primary market mm-hmm. so hmm. interesting so basically it's this is the price you're gonna pay us for it yep. you take the painting and off you go as soon as the hammer falls it's the uh, title passes to the okay. new owner and payment for this is right away or is there a certain amount of time we will we're not we we actually don't release any object that we sell uh, until full payment is received uh, within so many hours or <clears throat> no it we like we don't want to put it into storage because then we'll right. start charge storage fees but once it sells and the title passes it's under it's up to the the new owner to have it under their insurance right. to to collect the painting sure. and a lot of the buyers will want to have it right away it's that gotcha. yeah not, sure. it's that okay i bought it i want it right. i want to take it walk it out with me I, you know it's like the car auctions, I guess. Um, and your company does have, it's not just art. Your company yeah. also has um, other like wine, whiskey, cars, uh, jewelry. Yeah. <clears throat> just tell us a little bit more about that. So we have, uh, Bonhams has approximately 55 different collecting departments. So art is divided up into like 19th century, modern British, contemporary, post-war art, Japanese art, Chinese mm-hmm. art, Tibetan art. But we also sell cars, jewelry, um, furniture, design silver porcelain um but bonhams was originally the original owners of bonhams were actually car car guys they're car collectors so we have a very very broad um sales sort of calendar of car car sales throughout the year Mm -hmm. amelia island we sell at the grand palais in paris um so yeah there it's it's probably the biggest department that we have for cars cars and motorcycles we can see motorcycles as well you mentioned furniture is there really furniture that's a huge value? Like, what it, would classify that? So it's the furniture market has completely changed. Um, gone are the days of like 19th century pieces of furniture selling for a lot of money, unless it's of a, done by a major maker like Herder. Herder Brothers were out of New York. Um, right now, everybody wants uh, modern furniture. They want Nakashima. They want Finn Jewel. They want uh, brewer chairs. They want um, that kind of Bauhaus stuff. That is where it uh, sort of the furniture market is focused, okay. and that's where we get the best, the biggest prices because right. it fits into the space, smaller spaces. Sure, especially like the condos in New York or wherever it may be. Um, so we talk about art, and it's not just actually art about art in the painting side of things or pictures, but it could be anything from. Like you mentioned, the the jewelry, the furniture, the cars. Um, you also mentioned that your company will also like for celebrities if they had like it was auction if the celebrity passes or they're given or they want to auction off the entire uh, contents of the home, they would hire you to come down and assess everything and sell it. Yeah, we have um, uh, an estate department that handles a lot of that okay. material. We do house sales. Uh, well, they'll go in. They'll get contacted. We'll go in specialist departments will go in and they'll divide it all up and they'll sell it um some of the more famous um estates we sold we sold lauren bacall lauren bacall's estate um, a couple years back that was a three-day sale and uh currently well coming up we have um the estate of diane carroll it's gonna be sold in la la does a lot of our entertainment memorabilia um we have a big department there too Hmm. uh, because we have the partnership with turner classic movies okay there you go for for sure i mean that's i mean I, i this is this these are the stories I love hearing, love I love knowing about and talking about. <clears throat> On the car side of things, we talk about all numbers match. We talk about uh, the authenticity of the vehicle. And art has obviously the same effect. Like you mentioned about on the back that might have certain um, uh, serial numbers, certain codes, or, ty- or even the way the artist signs it, right hand, left hand, or whatever yeah. it may be. Um, I, I find that interesting. Like, do you actually have people trying to sell something that is a fraudulent 
Yeah. Have you ever gotten that? So the, the one of the big problems with provenance um, and labels on the backs of paintings, they can be easily faked. There is a huge, uh, there's a really good book about this called Provenance. And somebody was actually faking well-known gallery labels and sticking them back on, on the back of like really inferior paintings sort of trying to perpetuate that this gallery represented this artist getting more money mm -hmm. but a lot of the time the labels can be fake the provenance can be faked it's not airtight um so we whenever we're looking at something everything's got to be all the boxes have to be ticked For before sure. we take a painting okay. if we're suspect if we're suspicious of it there are experts in the in the art field we'll go to museum experts or recognized experts to sort okay. of give us the blessing and say gotcha it is it is by this artist yes right. i rem yeah and that authentication comes with many sort of problems as well okay. if let's say a collector had something and we needed to get it authenticated and the collector believed it to be by this artist and we get it authenticated and the recognized expert said well no it's not actually by this artist so then that collector wow. is going to come and say well who told you it's not by this artist and we're sort of the middle person mm -hmm. they then they there's some authentication boards that don't okay. do this anymore so it's um everything's got to prove itself to me for sure um okay. and i think th it's the same mentality of a lot of uh my colleagues mm -hmm. when we see something it's got to prove itself it's right. got to tell us that it's right. by this artist okay. and not later or a fake or right. a forgery or um we spoke at a christmas party um and we talked about this artist that you had spoken to me about and where he placed a banana oh, yeah. okay it's like your sculpture of toilet paper <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you put a label on that and you got you know i would love to um i would love to put a label on this but it's not for sale so um but uh that could be all part of the artwork it, well, <laughs> it can be part of the all, all of the artwork for sure and can you just briefly tell what we talked about that and on how like <clears throat> something so simple but yet the brand and the money that was generated like the it was mind boggling that's what that's why I was like glued to your story I'm like holy <laughs> shit you know uh, tell us a bit about that story so well the artist was Maurizio Catalan who's yeah. a very well known italian i would say installation artist um, like he's hung horses upside down from ceilings he's done he did a um, a very famous sculpture i think it was of the pope falling over it was a really cool sculpture. Wow. Um, but this piece was a banana duct taped to a wall. And it was a real banana. And apparently he had been thinking up this idea for about a year. <laughs> and he was trying to figure out how to do this banana. And he just decided he's going to go to the grocery store before, I think it was Art Basel opened. And he bought some a banana and he duct taped it to the gallery wall. And it, apparently he made an addition of three. And they were selling for $120,000. But I think what Jesus it, I think it, it's interesting because the edition sold out, All so people three. bought it. Um, you know, funny thing was that it, while it was on display, this Russian performance artist walked up and took it off the wall and ate it, <laughs> and that was part of that was all part of that was the that, art that was part of so that. the for him, he's sort of tapping in on the ready-made idea and Marcel Duchamp who did the very famous urinal um, and signed R. Mutt Maurizio Catalan is doing the same idea he's elevating an everyday object to a piece of art how many how often do we see bananas sitting around but it's but it's it it goes black yeah like it... so and that's why and it will go black and he understands that and that's part of the process again it's that so he sort of he stripped art down to the basis of all bases, and it's a banana. He said, I'm not going to sculpt a banana. Why would I do that? I'm going to stick a banana on the wall. And yeah, it sold out. And so it, it's his name and who he is. Obviously drove the price. Sure. His dealer uh, obviously drove the price, had the right clients, and everybody's still talking about it. There is, I saw recently on Instagram, there's a Russian graffiti artist. Mm -hmm. They did a massive 3D banana on the side of a building in Moscow or some somewhere in Russia okay. of the banana on the duct tape. It's like, why not? <laughs> and everybody, I think it, it's it's why not? It, I think it's smart. Sure, I it think is. it's super smart. It's brilliant. It's three hundred and sixty thousand dollars smart for the artist wow. in the gallery. 
but is, that is crazy. It he he's using his name, his brand. That's the thing. He's he, the brand. Yeah. So the, the the artist that did the duct tape the banana, and he just put it. Did he have like a, a fake frame around it? Nothing. It was duct tape on the wall. And there was a his banana from the, the grocery store and, and a name? label. And I think it yeah, it was labeled the side. And did he call it something? Uh, the comedian. <laughs> he so called the, it the comedian. He called it the comedian. Did all three have the same yep. name? Yep. And yep. he sold all three. Sold all three. For I think a museum bought one. Some uh, collector bought one, and another uh, an, another collector bought that one. That is. So the bonkers. comedian. So the comedian. The title is important too, because when you think about it, the comedian. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know. He's being a comedian. He's saying, you know, wow. he's basically saying, you know, I'm the comedian here. You guys are looking at this. Wow. It caused a sensation. People are doing Instagram. Like, Unbelievable. But when you think about where he's coming from and what Marcel Duchamp did by right. putting a urinal in a gallery and signing it R. Mutt, the exact same idea. You're elevating everyday objects. Right. To and people are phone. going crazy for that, clearly. Yeah. Marcel Duchamp had this brilliant idea and it was like 1913 1913 armor show in new york okay. and he had a urinal and he i think he oh it's just like the the porcelain part of the urinal right and he put it there as a sculpture and he signed it r dot mutt m-u-t-t -T. he didn't sign it marcel duchamp he just created this art he just created a signature and he was just he's mocking basically the art world because everybody when they usually do big exhibitions or big salons or shows like that they sign their name really large to make sure people know who did it so he did this on purpose okay. to say you know that he's is... basically giving the finger to the art world no shit exactly you know? what he's doing it's it, you said it perfectly yeah you know. what is the <clears throat> the most expensive artwork that you sold so and hey, name the artist if you don't yeah mind. yeah um two so when i was working uh when i started when i was working at um the toronto auction house we partnered with sotheby's mm -hmm. and we would administrate their canadian auctions and they're big sales so okay. and we had a painting come come in and it was done by an artist named paul kane paul kane was a 19th century canadian artist who traveled on behalf of the hudson bay company all around um uh, Canada okay. in the early 19th century mm -hmm. documenting the indigenous population. Wow. So this painting was of um, an explorer named Captain Lefroy and it came directly from his family. Mm -hmm. So the estimate, the pre-sale estimate going into the sale was 300 to 500,000. And no no painting in Canada I think up to that point. This was a number of years but I think it was 2001 this okay. happened. No painting in Canada had, I don't even think, touched a million dollars up to that point. So the auction started, and um, we're in the room, we're watching, and this is, I was, you know, um, standing, watching what was going on, and the bidding started to climb, and it reached 500,000. Slowed down, nothing was going on, then it picked back up again, and it went, uh, kept on climbing, and the hammer price was 5.5 million. Are you kidding me? It no. closed at 5.5 .5 million. They hammered at 5.5 .5 million. I just remember taking it off the wall and putting it in its crate going, hey, don't drop it. Don't drop <laughs> it. So now you can actually see the painting at the Art Gallery of Ontario. By, by a Canadian? It, uh, yeah. Purchased by a Canadian? It was bought by Ken Thompson. Ken. It's in the Thompson collection. I, we can say that because yeah. it's the Thompson collection and it's right there. <clears throat> gotcha. Um, so for the longest time, that for a good number of years, that was the highest price in Canada ever paid for a painting um, that I was involved with. Right. Recently, that's been broken by Lauren Harris, and Lauren Harris sold a couple of years back for okay. fourteen million. But at Bonhams, mm -hmm. I think the one of the m most exciting paintings we've sold uh, was an artist named Frank Auerbach, who is part of the British Maud Brit movement around 1960, 1950, 1960 painting with Lucy and Freud and Francis Bacon. But this painting um, came to us through, uh, not an estate, but it was through a family um, that used to travel to England a lot. Okay. And they had a business. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the business was, but they had a business where they had to travel to England and they brought this painting back to Canada. What was interesting was um, in all the literature on our back, it was always listed as whereabouts unknown. Hmm. Well, it was actually, our office used to be in Yorkville, and it was actually um, right behind us. So we you went over, didn't we didn't know, we, nobody knew, it was in, obviously it was a right. private collection, sure. so we went to see it, and it was of one of his lovers, 
-hmm. And it was a beautiful painting, right. really nice. We got it consigned, went up for sale. I think the pre-sale estimate was 1.5 million pounds. Wow. And ended up hammering at two and a half million pounds. Jeez. Such an important painting. But it was cool because whereabouts unknown, well, it turns up in Toronto. It turns up right near our office. And it's important because it's what it's a major work by him, and mm. you know to see that and to be able to hold that and sure, the two point five million was was pretty good. Um, we've had a Matisse go through a Matisse, Palmer Matisse collage that mm -hmm. sold for one point five million in New York. Wow. So yeah, it's it, it's like it's mind boggling. Like I mean, I, I if I if I even spend more than three hundred dollars on a painting, my wife would have my <laughs> so. And and I love I love the artwork I love, you know the, the little amateur auctions we have at, at fundraisers and yep. sort of stuff. You know it's fun. It's all it's all good and dandy, which is great. But I would love to sit back and just, um, it, it, is it possible to just to, if you would invite me down? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, would you invite me down to an auction one day if, if that's local? And I'd yep. like to watch how this all unfolds. You yeah, know? auctions. Yeah, there's there. Oh, you can walk in. You don't need to pay anything. So they're you don't all need open to the public. And I do. Yeah, I do a lot of charity auctions too, and they're open to the public. Okay. Um, but you know, Bottoms don't doesn't sell in Canada. Obviously, like we're a sourcing office. Right. But for other auctions, like other auction houses, they hold them quite regularly, and you can go in, and if there's something there, you bid on them, and hmm. yeah, it's fun. It's it's no kidding. It's, it's a good time. Yeah, for sure. I think I, I know you're having a good time yeah, because yeah. what's that? Oh uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> or it's like Mickey Blue Eyes. Ha, <laughs> ha. <laughs> 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 I just think it's a it's a cool job, um, and you're and you're you know you're you know the painting, you know what the art is about, and you're watching these people bidding on it. Is there a reserve on these paintings? Yes. Okay. And it's a uh, that's confidential between the consigner and the auction house. There is okay because yeah. cars you can have a reserve or non-reserve. Yeah, and you can have non-reserves as well. Usually we have a reserve something right. set because we want to respect, like we're working on behalf of the consigner. We don't want to see sure. it sell for nothing. Right. Um, but yeah, and, and the estimate then is a guide to the potential buyer. Absolutely, because you don't want to all of a sudden, like I'll tell you just a quick little story. We had a, we had a customer of ours that uh, that wanted to buy this, um, uh, this Ferrari Special, 1959 Ferrari Special, but it was, it was a replica. The new one, the, the original ones are about 10 million, okay? This one was hand-built replica, uh, and the, the gentleman, the, the builder paid, probably got a million dollars into this car. He put a no reserve in it and lost his shirt on this deal because he thought, I'm going to get this, I'm going to get a million for sure or whatever going to get. He barely got <clears throat> half that. And the guy who bought it obviously is loving it because there's no reserve. He got it for, you know, five hundred thousand. Very rare. Rare do we do that? We do it if there if it's an estate situation and we just right. we need to move. You need to move the product. We need to move the product yeah. out. Um, a lot of the time there are reserves, and so when we give a less than estimate, we give a high and a low. So and usually the reserve has to be by law. We follow auction law, even though there is sure. no real sort of mm -hmm. set law in Canada. By law, it's got to be sort of on the low end of the estimate, or a little bit percent, a, per, a little bit below, a percentage below, and we follow that. And the auctioneer knows it; they follow it. And then when the auction starts, we bid up to that reserve. We protect the lot up to that reserve. So okay. if it doesn't sell, it doesn't sell. We buy it in, and right. not <clears throat> physically like we're not paying the money to buy it in. We're right. just passing it. Just and passing same thing through. with car, car sure. options. Yeah, so. the cars the same way. It's like we see it, and <clears throat> the potential buyers could. They can walk away with a great deal yep. on a really amazing product, yep. right? So, so um, a lot of the artists that were doing this in the 20th century, like Warhol, Miro, Picasso, um, they have catalog resumes where somebody has actually sat down and documented every single print that has been done by that artist and how many were um, were signed, how, how many were numbered. Were they artist proofs? Were they outside of the edition? Like in the edition, usually about 250. Um, were they signed in pencil? Were they signed in ballpoint pen? Um, that's something unique with Warhol, apparently. Like, there's his um, Elizabeth Taylor print that he did, and it was signed in ballpoint pen. That's him. And if it's not, and they're. Um, but they do, they will go up in value. Um, if there's a lot of prints by those artists that aren't signed by them, and they are the ones that aren't, not as, they're not worth as much. 
they're more decorative in the so in the ebay world i guess it, ebay is an auction as well but it's more of the primary market mm -hmm. they can sell for money but gotcha. in in like for us if somebody brought us a, a group of seven print like that unfortunately it's not something we could sell it's only going to be a few hundred dollars um um there are other uh artists who who've done the same and there, there are you know correct that there are a group of seven prints there was a printmaker named samson matthews that printed a whole bunch of group of seven work silk screen them and they're worth some money they can sell for five hundred to a thousand dollars depending they're a little more rare but the foundation ones aren't as much because the group never had anything to do with them right they never they never were authorizing them or they weren't like overseeing the printing or doing anything like that for the people out there is there like um a book they can buy do you know of a book there is a, like like the 101s of of our what to look for if they wanted to get not into the expensive stuff but like just 101 on art itself i think um there's a couple of you know always there's tons of books out about okay. the auction world i think um the one i mentioned about Pro, it's called provenance provenance um right. there's another one there's a, an art there's two books one was called um one is called the twenty million dollar stuffed shark, and it was about Damien Hirst, shark mm. and formaldehyde, which was, which was written just when the contemporary market was taking off, and subsequently the same author um, has written another book called the Big Orange Balloon Dog, which is Jeff Koons okay. Big Balloon Dog, and it talks about the ins and outs of the art market. And perfect. Th the big thing about the art market is it's so unpredictable. You don't know what's going to be happening from day to day. Gotcha. And that's the exciting thing about it. There's it certain areas that are, are usually very stable, but mm -hmm. then there's other things like, wait a minute, what? we don't know what's going to happen. Right. You know. So, it, and I'm going to, the same thing with the car business is that <clears throat> there's a trend of vehicles that are have skyrocketed in price. Certain brands of vehicles. Like, for instance, the older Porsches, the 911s, uh, certain model years are just astronomical in pricing but it was never like that and for some reason I can't tell you exactly why the trend just went skyrocket but we we do have an idea because of the overseas market paid huge money for it and that's where it started to escalate the pricing of this model cars is artwork the same way like for instance let's say you had a painting from um, actually, if you give me an artist's name. Um, Picasso. Okay, Picasso. So a Picasso painting, let's say we go for, let's say, like, you know, 700000 for this certain painting. Um, if someone said, if someone came in and, and offered, like, $3 million for these paintings, would that drive all of Picasso's paintings to a certain level? Yes. It would. Short answer would be yes, depending on the period that it, the period that it, it, it's from his work right from his work overall depending on you know when it was painted was it a strong painting by him mm -hmm. the artist had bad days yeah everybody's got bad days sure. and there's bad work out there by That's what's good artists you, there's there's some bad, there's work, bad out there. work out there by good artists right. like you know you look at you look at the group of seven and there's some phenomenal group of seven panels out there there's also some not so phenomenal panels out there but it's because they're signed by ay jackson or J. J. H. McDonald, whatever, but they'll still sell for good money because they are. Um, it's that name. It's that brand again. Right. Um, and Picasso is a massive brand. Sure. Um, but yeah, it will always drive that price. So you know, the market for a certain artist will always it will pull everything else with it. Right. By that artist. Right. Are these paintings of these like Picassos and and uh, can you go to the a gallery and buy a painting from Picasso, or is it only, or is it only through auctions? You can, but you're going to be marked up, right? As we right. spoke about before, okay. because the dealers will have it's, be able to broker right. whatever deal, or be able to buy at auction. But yeah, Picasso, I think is not as much in a gallery. You'll be able to buy to buy a phenomenal Picasso etching or a lithograph that he had done. He was quite prolific. He and produced everything like ceramics, sculpture. Wow. Um, but for like a group of seven work, you'd yeah, definitely be able to walk into a gallery and buy one. I like that. Um, speaking of liking, I like this wine that we're having today. Um, so the, the wine that we is one of my go to wines we have at our, at our place, uh, which is a uh, Castiglione Chianti. Um, 
it is listen it's 16 bucks at the lcbo i'll, I'll have all the links up on on our on my website and, and all the the names of the books that that perry brought uh, uh told us about because these are all good books for people for knowledge just to know about the why uh, know about the um the arts and the wine is a, a delicious wine um it's a nice chianti nice red we all have our go-to wines we have many um and and uh, you know i appreciate the um uh you know the time that you're with me here and enjoying the wine and speaking of wine also you do auction off wine yes. um and obviously, it's wine that we would never have at my podcast. Uh, some of the wines you probably auctioned off on there. Uh, it, it's interesting because you know when I work at the smaller Toronto auction house, we'd hold regular wine sales in conjunction with the LCBO. Okay. Um, the only wine sales that would happen in, have, have ever happened in Canada, I believe. Yeah, Does it? It has to go through LCBO. Obviously. Um, that's how they operated it. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, they would. We would sell like uh, Sasakaya. Wine, we right. or Nalaya. I have, I have a Sasakai up there. We so have. yeah, there are there wines that you'd be able to to you sample can, as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> collectors also that have art, have cars, would also have wine collections. Um, are you hired to go? Not uh, so. If you're not, uh, let's say you went to the U.S., you went to Italy to, to auction off some wine for a certain collector. Um, has that happened? That has not happened. No, okay. <laughs> maybe but one can, day. No. But, but it can. Um, it can happen. Obviously, yeah. It would be like wine collections are usually That'd be an awesome gig. That would be great. Usually gig to huge. Do. Oh, um, we we have an office in Italy, but we would probably send the wine to London to sell. It's a bigger market. Gotcha. Okay, that's what I wanted to ask about. Like, what is the for for wine? And we'll talk about. I think whiskey is also yeah. a, a very huge. good brand, but for wine, um, we're is the best market for wine uh for selling wine well london is because it's a main sale room so we we do hold sales of wine in new york okay. we hold sales of wine in london and in hong kong hong kong is huge it's huge um for wine whiskey and watches and watches wine whiskey and watches the three w's yeah it's, i love it's, that it's uh it's that sort of um uh, luxury brand that prestige that sort of prestige of owning this phenomenal bottle of wine you have your friends over oh let me show you the watch i just bought or mm -hmm. um, you know let me pull out this bottle of japanese whiskey that right. is phenomenal or but yeah it's wine watches and whiskey and whiskey in hong kong they love their i would never think watches was a big thing in hong kong to be honest with you i didn't think yeah. And, and usually, you know, Chinese people are very superstitious about watches and clocks and the numbers, you know, the and, numbers, you know. and, and also if you give somebody a, a watch or a clock in Hong Kong, it means death because you're counting time. But Hong I Kong, know that. I Hong, did Kong not know that. Uh, Hong Kong uh, buyers, yeah. Well, it, it's all about it's all about how you're presenting yourself to your friends. Right. So they're going to have the best piece of art on the wall. They're going to have the best bottle of wine to offer at dinner they're gonna mm. eat, eat off the best porcelain and you know um it's nothing it, it's human nature it's right. it's that mentality that Absolutely. if you have the money spend it right um there is a there's a, a couple of documentaries out on on the uh, on netflix <clears throat> about the wine business and the fraudulent aspect of the side of it um i'm not gonna get into that i i i was more intrigued on on your on your artwork, <laughs> <laughs> we had Stefan that just blew his nose all over the place here, but yeah, it's okay. All over Nelson. <laughs> all over Nelson. The toilet paper is not for sale. Yeah. It, it can be for sale. There's a bottle of Purell here for you guys. Um, so, I, I I love the 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 art side of it. The the print, the fabrics, the um, uh, the uh, the other art that you talked about. Which was a st I guess the station art, like the people, like the guy who hung the horse upside down. Oh, uh, installation, I installation, yeah, all that sculpture. Like I love that. I, I love to walk downtown. Is there a place in downtown Toronto that you can actually see stuff like that well, outside? Tons of galleries. Like well, obviously the Art Gallery of Ontario has a phenomenal collection. Okay. Um, that's where the Thompson collection is. The gotcha. Best collection of Group Seven. There's okay. McMichael. Um, there is the Museum of Contemporary Art. But any small gallery in Toronto, any. And they're dealers, they're given dealers. their dealers, yeah. but they're showing what is happening in Canada right now, or in Toronto, or okay. Canadian artists. And 
you know, I've done art tours where I've taken people downtown and walked them through, like, done a gallery tour in an afternoon. And, you know, they're people my age. They right. have a little more disposable income. They're like, oh, I never knew this. Walk through a gallery and see what's there. And you're looking at original works of art. Hmm. I like Photography, that. painting. Yeah, absolutely. Installation. Uh, it may not be to their taste, but they're getting the experience of actually walking into a gallery mm -hmm. where the dealer will actually come out and say hello and not just sit back and, right. you know, not talk to you because they know you don't have any money. Like, it, it's it's that perception of that up on a pedestal. Sure. Well, no, you got to knock all that out because every dealer and every gallery will want to see you. Like, you know, they have to. They, exactly. It's the foot traffic. It's, right. And then... Um, That's a potential sale. Totally. And yeah. it may not be me or you right. or Nelson or stuff, but it, somebody we know and say, oh, I was in this gallery and right. like I saw this great work by this artist. And when it all comes down to it, it's not like if you go to a dealer in Toronto, it's not that expensive. Mm -hmm. It's very, you know, reasonable. It, right. You'd, you know, what, thousand dollars or something? Given that's a good chunk of change, but if you really like that piece of art and it's going to be with you for a long time, then... Then that, that's, it's worth it totally worth it right so yeah. um i'm gonna list all the art galleries or mostly art galleries that perry suggested all the end of the podcast um you know i i we're giving away um we give away a free giveaway every every episode so this today's episode which i'll give away uh tonight online to a uh listener and uh, we are giving away a gift certificate from Fab Concepts, which is Fab Restaurants. They are affiliated. They own uh, Brazen Head, uh, Against the Green. Um, there is a bunch of restaurants in downtown Toronto, the Dominion, East of Brunswick, uh, Murphy's Law, Pie Bar, um, the Poor House, and the Goodman. So it's $25 gift certificate uh, from the graciously donated from uh, the Brazen Head or Fab uh, Restaurants. Uh, thank you very much, and we'll have their we have their logo up on our site and so forth. I'll give away that tonight to a listener, um, Perry. I really appreciate you coming in tonight. Um, oh, it's been a lot of fun. It's uh, you know we've we could talk forever about it, but like it's like, um, and I think we at towards our end of our conversation we spoke about if somebody wanted to go to buy some art, um, these art galleries, yes, they pay a little bit more. But is it worth for them to research to go to auctions and and obviously try to purchase a painting? But would they know offhand what they're bidding on or what's going to be in that auction? Well, well, that's what the auction houses are there for. They're here to help people buy something. I think it's important that um, anybody going to an auction, anybody going to a gallery, even if you don't know about art, you don't ask questions. Don't be scared. Like okay. that's my job is to answer. So once we get something in, my job is to then to sell the piece and then it's to answer the questions that people have. So you'll um, get people that are in the audience say like well, ask uh, questions about it before the auction. Before, Usually okay. they're leading not, up not and then they know. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, but no, ask the questions like okay. even, you know, you go to a, uh, an art gallery, a small gallery, a small dealer in Toronto, it's dealing in contemporary art, ask questions about the artist. They want, they're there to sell art. They're, right. they don't want to lose business. They're there to, to help you. Um, you always, you always per think or you always portray the, the art industry as a nose up, um, not talking to you and you know, you're there and you're like scared shitless of trying to, you know. So the best story I have sure. about yeah. nose up art industry. So I have a very good client um, oh. who is, owns a lot of land mm -hmm. and he's a develop. Uh, he owns a lot of land out West. Okay. And he walked into a, a very, very well-known gallery in Toronto and so he doesn't dress like he would, you would, if you looked at him, you would never know who he was. So he doesn't dress in like designer wear. He wears plaid. He doesn't have a sort of funky haircut. He's got long hair, usually tied back into a ponytail. He has a beard. He's got glasses. He wears ripped jeans, got cowboy boots. He walked into a gallery and some uh, this attendant came up to him and said, should you actually be here? And he walked back out again and he said, forget yeah. that seriously okay. meanwhile he owns wow. half of the west coast and oh my yeah. god uh, and sure. i've known him forever and he's a sweetheart and he's lovely 
but he tells me he when I first met him he told me that and I'm like oh man uh, is that person just, still employed <laughs> you just never know like you just never you know. never know and just like any of my clients like they may not have something they'll come to us and we say oh the painting isn't worth a lot right. of money unfortunately but then we give them a good experience sure. and we're not you know we're civil with them we give them a good experience they may know somebody that has something exactly and it's all the network it's the network and that's what we we have we really mm -hmm. work with that's what For we sure. work on is customer service we have to be you have you know, to we're in the service industry so it, you you're you don't just have a product that you just bring in and it sells itself you know nope. you got to sell it oh god yeah you got to sell it yeah. and uh and I, you know perry listen i mean i love talking about it. i love knowing about the artwork um your stories about it um great wine great people got it's it, it's a great great evening for this and i appreciate you coming in tonight Thank um you. and i you know like I said, I am I am new to this podcast. I'm new to all this aspect. You know, uh, to have you come on board is, is great. Thank you. It's an honor to learn about art, but also someone who's experienced in, you know, just the, the lingo, uh, what to look for, things you should do, things you should not do, um, which is which is very helpful. So uh, can they get a hold of you at all, like through uh, like a generic email or something like online about art or is that something you really got into? Yeah, no. Um, so my main email is perrytonguecontemporary at gmail.com. Okay, I'll and, put that up on the website. And after. Usually you can find me, obviously you go to Bonham's website, you'll okay. find me uh, under Bonham's Canada. Gotcha. So all the stalkers out there who want to know this. <laughs> <laughs> I am not going to give away this toilet paper, uh, this thing here. So, Nelson, I'm sorry, but uh, it's not for sale. Guys, I really appreciate you tuning in tonight, and uh, I'm going to give away that uh, that gift card after my live set of music, which I'll have uh, performed right after I speak to Perry. And, Perry, listen, thanks very much for an awesome, uh, oh, hang awesome on. evening. Hang on, hold and, on. Oh, Let's get some more wine nah. in that glass. Don't kill the glass. There Don't worry go. about it. It's all good. Thanks very much. Appreciate Cheers. it. Cheers. Cheers to uh, everybody here tonight, and... Um, it's all about raw, real talk, unscripted. We just winged it, which is great. I appreciate that. I make notes just to I can remember some things we talked about. Um, guys, thank you very much. Have yourself a great evening. Appreciate it very much. Peace out, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you.
Not a whisper in the breeze. Not a whisper in the breeze. Not a star in the sky can tell me. Not a whisper in the breeze. Not a whisper in the breeze. Not a star in the sky.